Good morning. Before I go to church, let me do this little posting. I will let John Piper t tell you about how prosperity gospel will actually make you poor spiritually and financially. The people, the only people who gain financially are those preachers and they live very lavish lifestyle. So I'll just, rather than plagiarize, let him talk about it in the next clip. And I, I've analyzed some of Paul White's sermons and I know why, why it is so effective. And I've been to a church like that and have made tens of thousands of dollars of contributions. It's, it's because when someone goes to church, especially if then they have a deep need, they won't go to a Presbyterian or Methodist or Episcopal church. They will go to a new agey church because they see the power or so-called power in their movement. And if you have a deep need, you have pressure at work, you have a financial situation, you have a chronic illness, you would come to them, to this prosperity pastors for for a breakthrough it's what you need but they promise more than that it's not just a breakthrough they promise that if you sow your seed there it will grow so exponentially it will like blow your mind your life will be flowing like so smoothly there's no disease there's no financial need but that's that's actually incorrect the only people that benefit are them but then they don't really benefit because according to people who have left the movement there is this deep spiritual hunger because f earthly things can only do so much in the end we are poor because we are looking for the gifts rather than the giver and the bible does say god is our exceeding great reward he is the reward it's the giver that is important, not the gift. When we have God in our hearts, no matter what our situation is, we are at peace. Just as I heard another Catholic pastor say, you know, the, this promise of that life should be flowing with all kinds of goodies, that there should be no sickness. And if you worship the Lord and are, and are really committed, that you will be spared of this, but nothing is further from the truth, even from scriptures. Look at Job. He did everything right, but yet he was tested. So to, to lie to people that if you just contribute enough, your life will be free of earthly concerns. But earthly are we, and earthly concerns will we have disease, no matter how hard we pray, financial difficulties, the kids need braces and you need to pay the rent and cars breaking up. These things are part of earthly life that in spite of them, God will find a solution for us to move through. It's not that you pay your tithes, you didn't, you know, you haven't paid your your contributions to to a minister who can give you a special clarifying vision you know, Paula White is very fond of saying, I have a prophecy, like she's this new age prophet. You know, she talks constantly of God giving him her prophecies. See, that's another, I think it's very, very dis misleading, really, considering what her life is. Married three times and three marriages are really adulterous marriages. And she's, she's an opportunist. I mean, she is Jezebel in the flesh. But... Like I said, I, I've analyzed their, her sermons and what she says is, the season is changing. Change is going to come in your life right now. Make your contributions in the next hour, next 45 minutes. The power, this is hour, power, power, hour, whatever. And where your gift will be blessed and your harvest will be exponential. It, it's, it's all a lie. Read your scriptures, you know, walk daily with God, that no matter what, He will come to provide for you. Our Lord's Prayer says, give us today our daily bread. And that's it. You see, enough for the day. Let tomorrow take care of itself.
because like look at the lilies they don't plant and sow and put into the barns but yet their beauty is greater than Solomon we are worth more than sparrows we are worth more than lilies God loves us it deflects attention onto God's gifts as the main source of our happiness rather than God himself. It obscures texts like, whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth, there's nothing that I desire besides you. Texts like, at God's right hand, are pleasures forever more or I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord the emphasis falls so heavily on happiness because of the gifts that he gives like health wealth prosperity rather than on him that's number one number two the cross itself and its proper function is obscured or the crucified life is obscured peter says in his first letter that christ died not so that we wouldn't have to suffer but so that we would have a model for how to suffer that's what he says in 121 and following christ gave you an example by suffering. So follow your suffering example. And I don't hear the note of suffer with Christ, but rather he died so that we could have an easy life. Third, the prosperity gospel ignores the profound redemptive historical shift between the Old and New Testament from a come-see religion to a mainly go-tell religion. Here's what I mean. In, in the Old Testament, clearly, the Queen of Sheba was supposed to cross hundreds of miles and drop her jaw at the wealth of Solomon and say, you've got a great God. That's the pattern in the Old Testament. You, you don't have in the New Testament anything like, oh, pa pastors should live in palaces so that the Queen of Sheba could come and say, whoa, I'd like to be a pastor, be able to live like that. You don't have anything like that. Instead, all the focus goes on to the Great Commission and Paul saying something like, I don't count my life of any value or as precious to myself if only I might complete the ministry that the Lord gave to me to preach the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, wartime simplicity to get the gospel to the unreached peoples of the world is the emphasis rather than Christians having a lot of accumulated wealth and give our wealth for the sake of the nations. The fourth reason is because love and faith are misconstrued by the prosperity gospel. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, first two verses, the Macedonians are being held up as a model for the Corinthians. And the way they are held up as a model is that the grace of God fell upon them, came to them, brought them out of darkness into light. And then it says that they were in a extreme form of poverty. And out of their poverty, a abundance of joy overflowed through their affliction. So you got poverty that hasn't gone away because of grace, and you've got affliction, and in the middle is this Vesuvius of joy in spite of poverty, in spite of affliction, pouring out in generosity for the poor saints down in, in Jerusalem. And Paul calls this in verse 8, love. So I think if you overpromise your people that things are going to go well for them and they will prosper because of the gospel, you undermine the possibility of loving like that. 
loving in spite of affliction, loving in spite of poverty, because your joy obviously is grounded somewhere else than in the removal of affliction or the removal of poverty. It's in God's, God's grace. So that's the fourth reason. And the fifth and, and final thing I'll say is simply from Philippians 1, 20 and 21, that the, the majesty and the beauty and the glory of Christ is going to be obscured if we don't make plain to our people that one of the primary ways that Christ is magnified is when we are more satisfied in him than in the things we are losing. Paul says, my desire is that Christ would be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so Christ is magnified when in my dying by which I lose everything, I consider that a better deal than if I had everything in this world. And so the glory of God is obscured. The glory of Christ is obscured, I think, by the prosperity gospel. I really pray that you would reorient your life if you're involved in it and embrace Christ as your supreme treasure.